We now begin Lecture 26, the urogenital system. Uh, we now study the development of the secondary sex organs. These will uh, include figures uh, 13, 32, 33, and 34, and others. Uh, we again remind ourselves there is an indifferent stage at weeks 5 to 6 where both the mesonephric, the wolfian, which is the male ducts, and the paramesonephric or mullerian, female ducts, will be present. This is a flow chart showing us the events uh, that must occur for differentiation in the male direction. So we see there's a sex determining region of the Y chromosome <coughs> in the embryonic germ cells, the SRY gene. This produces <coughs> the testes determining factor. So the SRY gene uh, has a gene product, the TDF. Uh, this uh, initiates the production of the multiple uh, proteins that cause the gonad to differentiate into a testis which has, as we know, the Leydig cells that secrete testosterone that controls the development of the, the Wolfian ducts uh, into the accessory structures and the development of the male external genitalia. The Sertoli cells uh, are, of course, inside the seminiferous tubules, and they secrete the Mullerian inhibiting substance that causes a regression of the Mullerian duct, of course. So we see the key below. The integrating center, uh, the primordial germ cells, uh, the Leydig cells, the Sertoli cells, the efferent pathway, and then uh, the tissue responses. The male ducts, then, again, are the mesonephric ducts. They begin as urinary tubules, as we know. The proximal portion becomes the epididymis. We see this approximately week eight. Uh, distal portion will become the vas deferens and the ejaculatory duct that opens into the prostatic urethra. So the prostate is formed by out outgrowths uh, from the urethra in that area. Uh, the mesonephric ducts uh, disappear in females, uh, as we know. The female ducts then, the paramesonephric ducts, become the female ducts. The cranial ends open into the abdominal cavity, as the fallopian tubes, as we'll see, or uterine tubes. And they continue caudally and fuse in the midline, and they will form the, futer, the uterus excuse me, at that point. So we'll, we'll uh, refer you to Table 13.1 for the uh, adult derivatives and remnants in your textbook, uh, but we will uh, review those uh, as we proceed to this discussion. So this figure is showing us the bipotential stage uh, in the middle and then the lineage toward uh, female development on the left and the male development on the right. Since we just discussed uh, the factors for development along male lineage, we'll uh, do that first and then uh, review the female. So first we remind ourselves this is the uh, mesonephros. Uh, the metanephros uh, is shown here. And uh, the bipotential gonad or the gonadal ridge uh, is present in this area here. Uh, we see the wolfian or the mesonephric uh, duct. And then uh, alongside it, the paramesonephric or Mullerian duct. And of course, there are both the right and the left uh, corresponding ducts. We see the metanephros uh, developing with the ureters uh, connected, of course, uh, to the developing uh, urinary bladder in this area. The genital tubercle uh, has developed a, a bit uh, in the genital ridge, let's say, with the tubercle and uh, the cloacal opening uh, that we've discussed previously. So uh, when the events uh, occur as described, uh, the molecular events occur, uh, there's a triggering of the development in the male direction, and we've studied the develop of the testi. We now see the uh, epididym epididymis beginning to form here from the, um, the Wolfian duct. We'll use that terminology now. Um, and uh, it, of course, maintains its connect connection to the uh, cloaca. We'll just use that term at, at this time. We know it's the urogenital sinus portion of the cloaca. Uh, the Mullerian duct we see is degenerating because of the um, uh, Mullerian regression factor secreted by the, uh, the Sertoli cells. And then this continues to develop as organogenesis uh, does. Uh, ultimately, the complete testi with the reedy testes connecting to the epididymis, the vas deferens, um, and then, of course, the seminal vesicles will attach to the, the 
uh, vas deferens uh, just before entry into the prostate. The female uh, uh, sequence of events uh, is uh, basically the opposite, right? <clears throat> Without malarian regression factor present, uh, and uh, we go back all the way to the SRY gene there. If it uh, uh, is not present because it's genotypic XX or some aberration, then the Mullerian duct will persist and fuse uh, together at their, um, uh, we'll call this proximal, close to the, the gonad, developing gonad in this distal. Uh, they fuse together and begin to form the uterus. We see that the Wolfian duct, uh, the mesonephric duct, is uh, degenerating. Uh, and of course, the cortex of the gonadal uh, ridge uh, will uh, differentiate into the uh, ovary as we had studied previously. Now, this will proceed, of course, to produce the ovary. Still, both of these structures uh, will be up in the posterior abdominal wall. Uh, as we had described, uh, near the location where the metanephros will finally stop, right, because the adrenal gland is developing just in this area here. So they will stay in that area until a later time. This is showing them uh, descended here, but we'll, we'll dis discuss the descent of both gonads uh, a bit later. So they stay in their original position until a later stage of development. But this is showing basically the mature uh, structures here, uh, or let's just say the, the neonate. Uh, then the fallopian tube will open into the abdominal, uh, the peritoneal cavity, the greater omental sac, uh, and the oviduct will uh, open into the, um, the lumen uh, or the cavity of the uterus, which of course through the cervix um, opens into the vagina. This is figure 1333, and uh, it is a, a sketch uh, first of a ventral view and then of a lateral view. Uh, of the posterior abdominal wall of a seven-week embryo in A uh, and a nine-week uh, fetus uh, in B. So uh, we uh, again recognize the uh, gonadal ridges, the mesonephros, the mesonephric duct, the paramesonephric duct, uh, and they come together at the urogenital uh, uh, sinus and the, um, the two uh, uh, Paramesonephric ducts are coming together to form the uh, uterovaginal uh, primordium. So from this status, it will go one direction uh, or the other. And uh, we see a, a further advance uh, now uh, at the fetal stage, um, and we see the, uh, the uh, paramesonephric duct or the, uh, the Mullerian duct uh, opening into the uh, urogenital sinus here uh, that uh, um, extends into the, the phallic uh, portion of the, uh, the gonadal uh, tubercle, excuse me, the pubic tubercle uh, as the phallic portion of the urogenital sinus. There, uh, inside here there is a, uh, a sinus tubercle uh, that is significant. Uh, it uh, becomes the hymen uh, in females and uh, what's called the seminal uh, colliculus uh, in males. And this uh, colliculus is an elevated part of the urethral crest uh, in the posterior wall of the prostatic uh, urethra. So both of the uh, vas deverans um, will join together to form the uh, the uh, the portion uh, of the, the ejaculatory duct, excuse me, that, that opens into the prostate, into the prostatic urethra, more specifically. So this is uh, figure 1318, and it is uh, a couple of diagrams showing the division of the cloaca into the urogenital sinus and the rectum, so we recall that. Uh, so this uh, septum uh, intervenes and separates the cloaca into the rectum and the urogenital uh, sinus uh, anteriorly. Uh, we recognize uh, the um, development of the urinary bladder and the urachus that extends up to the uh, umbilicus. Uh, the uh, female uh, is shown here, uh, the development of the clitoris starting, and of course the uh, vagina 
uh, and the uterus is developing with the uterine tubes. In the uh, right panel, of course, is the, the male development, uh, and we see that the uh, gonadal, excuse me, the uh, pubic tubercle is elongating uh, to become the penis, and uh, the uh, uh, urogenital sinus will be converted uh, into the, uh, the entire urethra. Uh, there are different portions of the urethra, um, uh, prostatic and uh, penile, uh, and then there's a spongy one that we'll see uh, later and describe. So the testes we see is still in the abdomen, and the vas deferens or the ductus deferens is leading up to the seminal vesicles that will be uh, posterior and inferior to the urinary bladder. And we see that uh, for the male in this uh, uh, illustration. Uh, again, uh, we're now at the point where the testes uh, has uh, um, descended into the scrotum. We haven't discussed that specifically yet, but uh, we know it is a final destination appropriately. And we see this attachment called the gubernaculum, and uh, it's uh, ghost imaged all the way up to uh, where it uh, used to be. And we'll discuss that uh, in uh, greater detail. Uh, we see a remnant uh, of the uh, paramesonephric duct called the appendix of the testes. And then the mesonephric duct uh, persisted, of course, uh, through the development we discussed to form the, uh, the ductally efferenti uh, that connect the, the reedy testes inside here. Uh, so seminiferous tubules to reedy testi to ductally efferenti or efferent ductules uh, into the epididymis that has a head, body, and tail. Uh, and then uh, the ductus uh, deferens or the vas deferens will um, pass through the uh, inguinal canal into the abdominal cavity and meet the, uh, the duct of the seminal vesicle and then join with the vas deferens on the opposite side to form the ejaculatory duct that opens into the prostatic urethra. <clears throat> we see the prostate uh, developing here it, uh, as an outpocketing of the urethra, uh, primordial urethra in this area, and another gland that develops called the bulbo-urethral gland. Uh, from an outpocketing of the um, the early or the pr urethral primordia, and of course uh, the urogenital sinus uh, completely develops into the uh, prostatic urethra. There will be a membranous urethra here, and then the penile re urethra. In the female, we see the uh, remnants. Uh, well, first orient to the ovary, and here is a ligament that uh, runs. Uh, from the uh, ovary past the uterus, actually attaches to the uterus connective tissue, and then uh, continues on down as the round ligament of the uterus, and we'll describe that in more detail in a, a bit. Um, uh, it is the homologue of the gubernaculum of the male. The uh, ovary then is our point of orientation, and uh, we see uh, the uh, epoupheron, a remnant of the mesonephric uh, duct, uh, or the Wolfian duct, and the Mullerian duct uh, has, of course, completed its development into the fallopian tubes and the uterus, and we see the, um, the vagina has developed in this area here. There's also an outpocketing that produces uh, the greater vestibular gland uh, for the female, the homologue of the uh, Bartholin's uh, gland that we described for the male. And... Um, we see the uh, former site of the mesonephric uh, duct. This is uh, an anterior view, and we see all the uh, images that we saw before. And this one is showing us that uh, some of the uh, Wolfian duct can persist as the uh, Gartner uh, or duct cysts. So, uh, you know, always some type of a problem when uh, something's supposed to disappear completely, but it uh, doesn't. We see the ovarian ligament attaching to the uterus, the, uterine, the round ligament of the uterus passing through the uh, inguinal canal and out uh, into the connective tissue, the subcutaneous fascia of the labia majora. And we'll see that uh, the, uh, well, the labia majora is the homologue of the scrotum in the male, and so this is the uh, gubernaculum in the male, and we see the route uh, of the male gonad for descent into the testy. 
so these are the uh, the homologs. Uh, the vagina is shown uh, here, of course, and the hymen uh, develops, as we had stated, uh, from that tubercle. And uh, the, the female is the Bartholin gland, uh, excuse me, Calper is the, the uh, eponym for the male. So the greater vestibular gland is Bartholin's, that is the homolog of the bulbourethral or Calper's gland in the male. Sorry for that error. So what is the name of the genital ducts that appear during development and what are their derivatives? The mesonephric or Wolfian and the paramesonephric or Mullerian. And in the male, we get the ductally efferentes of the testes, the epididymis, the seminal vesicle, ductus deferens, and the ejaculatory duct. As well, there is a utriculus uh, prostaticus. Let's not worry about that. The, in both sexes, uh, the trigone of the urinary bladder and the ureteric uh, bud uh, or Kupfer's uh, duct, and we will uh, have one slide of the adult urinary bladder to uh, view, uh, especially the trigone, uh, in a while. In the female, the perufron, the epufron, Gartner's cysts, as we saw. We didn't point out the epufron, but uh, no harm to us there. The uterine tube, the uterus, and the upper part uh, of the vagina, uh, of course, are formed from the uh, Mullerian ducts. So here we see the adult urinary bladder. Uh, this is an anterior view. It's a, uh, uh, a coronal section uh, through this. So we are looking from the front into the bladder, looking at the posterior wall of the bladder there. We see the peritoneum. Uh, the, it's actually parietal peri peritoneum, uh, really, that um, uh, falls over top of this. This is primarily retroperitoneal, never had a mesentery, always been outside the peritoneum. So we see the left and the right ureters, and they uh, pass posterior and inferior uh, to the urinary bladder and open in uh, to the uh, posterior inferior walls at the uh, ureteral orifices or ureteral openings. And they are two corners of this triangular shaped elevation in the urinary bladder. The third is the internal urethral orifice, so this is the uh, trigone, and you can see that it's uh, different. The wall is different, and the uh, the lining is a bit different uh, in its at least its contour than the remainder of the uh, urinary vesicle, as it's called, or urinary bladder. So there are rugae in the mucosa uh, out there. We see the detrusor muscle, the smooth muscle, mesodermal origin should always trigger that in our mind. We also see at the first part of the urethra. Uh, smooth muscle ring surrounding it, any muscular ring surrounding uh, a, a structure, a tubular structure with a lumen, uh, very likely is going to be a sphincter. This is the internal urethral sphincter or the involuntary urethral sphincter. <coughs> then we see the uh, first, actually the only part, <coughs> excuse me, of the female urethra, the membranous urethra passes through this uh, muscular layer between the ischiopubic rami of the pubic bone uh, and it is surrounded by skeletal muscle here and this is the external urethral sphincter. So this, everything we've described so far is common to male and female except in the male this portion is surrounded by the prostate and this would be the prostatic urethra. So females have only the membranous urethra by definition. And then uh, their urethra is shorter, and the external urethral orifice is shown here. The male, this would extend into the spongy urethra, uh, the penile urethra, and then the external urethral orifice uh, is at the distal end of the, uh, the glands of the penis. And we'll, we'll view the development of these structures uh, in a while. So what is the mesonephric or the Wolfian duct, and which structures develop uh, to form uh, in the male? Uh, so the common duct of the kidneys, we're not too worried about that. The male genital organs, that's uh, very generalized. The ductly efferentes testes, epididymis, seminal vesicle, uh, ductus deferens, the ejaculatory duct, and the ureteric uh, bud or, or Kupfer's uh, duct. So we're seeing these uh, terms, the ductly efferenti or efferent ductules, epididymis, seminal vesicle, uh, vas deferens or ductus deferens and the ejaculatory duct. So obviously these are terms you should know and recognize. So the uterus forms, as we stated, from the paramesonephric duct 
uh, which is also called the Mullerian duct. Now we can begin to discuss the development of the external genitalia about week nine, so it's in the uh, fetal stage already, uh, fully differentiated by week 12. It, um, of course, uh, the genital tubercle will be uh, in, the, in this area, in the cloaca, but it will really begin to take on uh, some active growth and development and differentiation uh, in week nine. The masculinization is induced by testosterone. This means that female uh, is the default. So the feminization is rela related to the placental and fetal uh, ovarian estrogen uh, if we uh, don't um, see the events described to differentiate the male gonad and bring about production of the testosterone. The testosterone is essential to trigger masculinization. So the representation of both se sexes, of course, is hermaphroditism or hermaphroditism. Uh, I will read this uh, for you, um, and uh, then we will view the, uh, the illustrations that accompany this legend. So the external genitalia during the sixth week uh, in elevation term, the genital tubercle develops anterior to the cloacal membrane. Its caudal surface is marked uh, by a trough-like depression termed the urethral groove into which the lower part of the urogenital sinus opens. On either side of the urethral groove are elevations termed urogenital folds, and lateral to the genital tubercle are paired ridges termed labioscrotal swellings. At the end of the embryonic period, the external genitalia of the male and the female are similar in appearance, but during the third month, the genital tubercle in the male becomes a recognizable penis, and the labios labioscrotal swellings fuse to form the scrotum. Toward the end of the third month, the urogenital folds fuse in the midline, transforming the urogenital groove of the male into the cavernous urethra. Uh, read that one portion again. So toward the end of the third month, the urogenital folds fuse in the midline, transforming the urogenital groove of the male into the cavernous uh, urethra. The penile urethra is the term that we had used. Sorry. In the, the female, the genital, uh, excuse me, the urethra at this time, however, does not extend uh, to the end of the glands. The distal part of the urethra and the definitive external urethral orifice are formed during the fourth month by the ingrowth of ectodermal cells uh, from the tip of the glands. So these types of junctions of ectodermal and endodermal um, uh, fusion, if you will, uh, require uh, extensive communication and growth of the uh, epithelial cells, and uh, anytime we have this occurring, there can be aberrations. So in the female, the genital tubercle becomes the clitoris. The urogenital folds remain unfused and become the labia minora, and uh, while the labia scrotal swellings become the labia majora. So here we are viewing, uh, we are seeing an inferior view of male uh, external genitalia on the left and female on the right. And this is the ninth week. So the yellow coloration it, it represents the labioscrotal swellings. Uh, the blue uh, coloration is representing the urogenital fold. And then the genital tubercle is shown in the, uh, the red color. And we see the space between the two urogenital folds is the urethral groove. Uh, in the male, of course, this will fuse in the midline, uh, and we'll, we'll follow all of that as we proceed. Uh, it's a bit less pronounced, but still quite equivalent in the female at the same stage. The coloration is indicating the same structures, so relatively uh, indifferentiated at this time. By the tenth week, uh, there are distinct differences. So there is an apparent shaft and glands of the penis from the genital tubercle. Uh, the um, uh, urogenital uh, folds are beginning to uh, fuse together, and we can see that they begin to fuse. Uh, the um, labioscrotal swellings will begin to fuse um, close to the, uh, uh, the perineal body here, the, the dense connective tissue connection between the anus uh, and the genital area, and it'll fuse uh, from that point posteriorly, proceeding uh, anteriorly uh, to the 
the tip of the penis. And so we will see uh, that hypospadia can occur where it doesn't uh, complete that fusion and the urethra can open anywhere uh, along this area of the penis. So this, these will fuse within the penis to form the uh, spongy uh, or the cavernous urethra or the, the penile urethra. So the, the scrotum develops in the male and uh, the labia majora uh, will develop in the female from the labioscrotal swellings. The urogenital folds will form the labia minora and then of course the genital tubercle will have formed the uh, clitoris. Here is a view. We now see the, the female on the left and the male on the right, uh, but uh, we uh, didn't even need these terms to recognize. Uh, we see the, the, the male uh, phallic, the, the penis, uh, the prepus uh, over the glands of the penis, the scrotum uh, bulging on either side. And then the female, the labia majora, uh, meeting anteriorly, the labia scrotal swellings, and then the, the clitoris and the uh, labia minora of the labioscrotal swellings. Uh, so it is uh, distinctive at this stage. This slide is showing us uh, stages of development of the external genitalia in the female. And panel A is at seven weeks. Uh, panel B uh, is uh, tenth week. Panel C uh, is 12. And then this is uh, near full term. <coughs> So we see the uh, labioscrotal swellings, the uh, urogenital folds with the sinus and the pubic tubercle that is uh, forming, of course, labia majora, labia minora, and the, the clitoris. And then we see uh, the anus developing, so the, uh, the septum will have separated the cloaca at this point here. And these take on a more elongated and uh, distinctive uh, appearance, recognizable. Uh, with the, uh, the separation of the urogenital folds or the labia minora persisting. It does not fuse. The labia scrotal swellings also do not fuse in the midline, obviously, such that uh, we have a space uh, between the labia majora. It is called the pudendal cleft. Uh, and then the space between the labia minora is called the vaginal uh, orifice or the vestibule of the vagina. And at full term, we uh, see this presented with the external urethral orifice positioned anteriorly in the vestibule of the vagina, the vaginal orifice positioned posteriorly, uh, and the clitoris is the most anterior structure. Uh, and of course, the labia minora come together to form the prepus uh, of the, uh, the clitoris. Then at term, we uh, see both male and female. So the prepus uh, of the, uh, the penis, uh, of course, uh, exists. In this case, it is retracted, showing the glands with the external urethral orifice uh, at the uh, very distal end of the, uh, the corpus uh, uh, spongiosum, the glands of the corpus spongiosum. Uh, and the, uh, the shaft of the penis, we see the raphe, the, the fusion of the labioscrotal swellings within the penis that formed the penile urethra. And uh, the labioscrotal swellings uh, have fused at the midline and uh, of course uh, are forming the scrotum. And then the female uh, structures uh, we uh, have shown here. So the, uh, the Bartholin's glands or greater uh, uh, vestibular glands uh, drain into this area, the most posterior, uh, portion of the vestibule of the vagina, the space between the two labia minora. So the openings into the vestibule of the vagina are the external urethral orifice, the vaginal orifice, and then the two uh, uh, vestibular uh, glands or Bartholin's glands. And then you see the perineal raphe uh, between the anus uh, and the uh, genitals. And we can review this again very quickly uh, in this view. Uh, the genital tubercle, the urethral grooves, urethral folds, uh, labioscrotal swellings, uh, and the anus. So the, um, the perineal um, raphe is beginning. In the males, of course, this perineal raphe is just the beginning of the fusion at the midline, and it proceeds all the way to the distal end of the penis so that it was closed uh, all the way and the scrotum forms, and of course in the female, the perineal raphe is the only uh, raphe that forms, and the, uh, 
um, the urethral groove persists as the vestibule to the uh, vagina. So which of the following statements uh, is true? So I've said it a zillion times, the urethral groove fuses uh, inside the penis and uh, forms uh, the penile urethra. So which structures contribute to the development of the vagina? The urogenital sinus uh, gives rise to the uh, sinovaginal bulb or the lower part of the vagina. And then the paramesonephric ducts, the malarian tubes, uh, give rise to the upper part of the vagina and the vaginal fornices that uh, surround the uh, cervix. So the cervix does protrude into the upper part of the vagina. And that upper part of the vagina uh, uh, is uh, in the portion that projects up above the uterus, the cervix, the vaginal fornices, uh, as well as the uh, uterus, the cervix in that area uh, of the uterus, uh, develop from the malarian tubes or the malarian ducts. So list the primordia of the external genital organs that are present in the six-week embryo, the genital tubercle. So there are the urethral folds, the urogenital membrane, and the genital swellings that we uh, uh, listed in the previous slide as well. So explain the mechanism of how the hypospadias may develop. So when fusion of the urethral folds is incomplete, in the male, of course, abnormal opening of the urethra may be found along the inferior aspect uh, of the penis, anywhere uh, along that length. It depends on the extent of the fusion. So the, uh, let's define the term hermaphroditism and list a few examples. So it's a complex malformation of the external and internal genital organs. A true hermaphrodite, there would be gonads of both sexes are present and the appearance of the external genitalia is variable. Pseudohermaphrodites, the genotypic sex is uh, masked by the phenotypic appearance that closely resembles the other sex. Female pseudohermaphrodites um, could be the, the 44 plus uh, XX uh, chromosomes. The patient has an ovary, but the external genitalia develop in a male direction. Or male pseudohermaphroditism, 44 plus the uh, XY, uh, chromosomes. The patient has a testis, but the internal and external sex characteristics may vary considerably. So uh, there's a wide range of uh, variations that might uh, occur. And of course, there's presently a, a significant social debate as to whether uh, the common practice of early surgical correction um, and determination of uh, which gender the individual will be uh, is now being challenged. So testicular descent obviously must occur in the male. We'll see that uh, the ovaries also descend, but not all the way, uh, obviously, into the labia majora. The testes will leave the intra-abdominal position by passing through a weakness in the anterior abdominal wall, the inguinal canal, just on either side of the pubic bone uh, at the attachment of the genitals or the, the penis in the male. Uh, the testes is pulled inferiorly, guided by uh, the gubernaculum uh, testes, which is equivalent to the uh, ovarian ligament and the round ligament of the uterus of the female. So all layers, muscle, connective tissue, uh, and skin, uh, not skin, that's an error. <laughs> we don't have any skin inside us. But muscle and connective tissue will pass uh, through uh, their, and will be represented as uh, layers of the uh, scrotal sac. So the uh, process uh, is controlled by testosterone, and the process is complete by week 27. If it does not, then there uh, is a condition called cryptorchidism. Uh, there can be cryptorchidism in the neonate, and sometimes uh, if I uh, am still quoting uh, present practice, uh, there is uh, you know, a, a bit of a delay before any action is taken uh, to uh, allow for the normal descent to occur. But persistent cryptorchidism uh, is um, uh, associated with infertility and a high risk of uh, testicular cancer, malignant, uh, of course. Uh, the ovaries also descend but stop inferior to the pelvic brim, uh, and the uh, homologue of the gubernaculum persists as an attachment from the ovary to the uterus, the ovarian ligament, and then from the um, uterus uh, out through the inguinal canal into the labia majora, the uh, round ligament of the uterus. 
So congenital uh, inguinal uh, hernia uh, is a, uh, a problem. A loop of the intestine can herniate through the opening from the peritoneal cavity, and it is more common in males. And, of course, that is uh, a direct hernia. Uh, it can be congenital, or it can occur uh, any time later in life as well. Congenital obviously has to be diagnosed early and uh, repaired uh, uh, as early as possible. So here in uh, panel A, uh, we are uh, looking at a sagittal section of the seven-week embryo, and we see the testis is up in the posterior abdominal wall, and the gubernaculum uh, passes uh, down to the, uh, the lateral part of the pelvic rim or pelvic brim, and uh, through the inguinal canal uh, and uh, down into the labioscrotal fold, and it is, of course, the gubernaculum. Uh, then uh, in panel B uh, and C, it'll be at about uh, 28 weeks, <coughs> showing the uh, processus vaginalis. So these are the layers of the body wall, uh, peritoneum, uh, the parietal peritoneum, uh, and the uh, loose connective tissue surrounding it, and the skeletal muscle and um, uh, fascia uh, of the anterolateral abdominal musculature. So this process of vaginalis begins to occur. So you can see how a congenital herniation might uh, occur if this didn't uh, repair itself uh, and close off uh, appropriately. It doesn't close off completely, but uh, sufficiently to form the internal inguinal ring that resists passage of the intestinal loops uh, into there. The testes is sitting right at the pelvic brim and has not yet crossed over uh, in uh, to the inguinal canal. And here we see it uh, from the uh, lateral view. Uh, the testy is just about to cross over uh, and come down through, and the process vaginalis will kind of pinch off and accompany it. Uh, here in panel D, we see an anterior view of this with the urinary bladder in the midline uh, and we can see the gubernaculum will guide the testy directly in. Uh, the testy is behind or posterior to the processus vaginalis and the processus vaginalis will uh, uh, accompany the testy into the scrotum. And so here we see the processus vaginalis uh, anterior to the testy within the scrotum and uh, the layers that came with it all uh, are part of the wall of the, the scrotum, uh, as well as this structure that uh, we see labeled uh, in panel F called the spermatic cord. We'll take a look at an illustration of the adult spermatic cord in a moment to look at its contents and the layers uh, of, uh, that surround it. And we see the remnant of the gubernaculum securing the testy uh, in the um, uh, the scrotum, and of course, uh, there's a thick layer of connective tissue around the testi, the tunica vaginalis. Excuse me, the tunica albigenia surrounds the, uh, the, the testi. The tu tunica vaginalis uh, is the, uh, um, that bit of peritoneum that came in with it. So this is the uh, adult... Um, Male uh, external genitalia, something obviously has been removed. You can see the look of shock on his face. Uh, sorry for that. That's a bad joke, but it kind of does look like shock. Right? <laughs> okay, let's move on. Uh, the uh, external, uh, the anterolateral abdominal musculature, uh, we see a bit of it here. Some of that skeletal musculature comes down with the layers uh, surrounding the spermatic cord. We see the contents of the spermatic cord on the opposite side, uh, and it, of course, surrounds the testy in this area. This is the skeletal muscle that um, is part of the uh, cremasteric reflex um, that can uh, pull the testy up into this area uh, where it is deep to the, just under the skin. This is where, of course, the physician will uh, loop a finger around this and have the patient turn their head the opposite direction and cough. That is called the um, uh, abdominal scrotal canals just under the skin in this area and then the spermatic cord passes through the external um, inguinal ring through the inguinal canal and enter into the pelvic cavity uh, in, internally. So there are several layers uh, to this. 
uh, spermatic fascia, as it's called, and I'm, I'm not going to uh, describe each of those layers. I want to just take a few moments to talk about the contents of the uh, spermatic cord. And we see, of course, uh, coming down through here is the ductus deferens, or the vas deferens. And then it is surrounded by an anastomosing complex of uh, veins. Um, and this is called the pampiniform plexus. And these surround the single or uh, the single uh, testicular artery. So it's a countercurrent flow. So the venous blood is warmed by the uh, uh, testicular artery, and the, testic the arterial blood is cooled by the pampiniform plexus because, of course, the, the reason that the testes have to descend in the scrotum for fertility uh, is um, uh, the, the requirement for the lower temperature. Uh, and so we need to sustain that by a countercurrent uh, thermoregulatory mechanisms. Uh, other uh, contents, whenever we see vasculature, neurovascular bundle. So the, the neural innervation. Uh, and as well, lymphatics. So testicular cancer uh, can metastasize through the lymphatics in this area into the uh, internal abdominal uh, lymph glands. So what is meant by uh, A, descent, uh, descending of the testes, and B, cryptorchidism. So the migration of the testes from the place of its development, the retroperitoneum, prim primarily retroperitoneal, to the, the scrotum. And so it's, it maintains that retroperitoneal association, if you want to think of it that way, uh, with the processus vaginalis or the tunica um, uh, vaginalis, uh, as it is called in the adult. Uh, and the testes are outside of that, behind it even, posterior. The testes uh, failed to migrate into the scrotum. It becomes jammed somewhere in its uh, pathway. Uh, that is, of course, cryptorchidism. So cryptic is uh, hidden. And orca uh, refers to the uh, testi. So that completes uh, our lecture on the development of the reproductive system, actually the entirety of the urogenital system. I appreciate your time.